from Exodus chapter 20, verse number 1. We're going to read through verse number 3. We're going to cover the first commandment. Exodus chapter 20, verse number 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Let's bow to this God once more as we approach his word together. Lord, you have caused read as we mark it up, as we learn from it, and as we hopefully inwardly digest it, so that through the patience we receive, through the comfort we receive from them, we might be better able to hold fast to the blessed hope that is in Christ Jesus. The hope of life everlasting. The hope of forgiveness and adoption. The hope of freedom. God, we pray these things in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I believe in God. I'm not a religious fanatic. I can't remember the last time I went to church. But my faith has carried me a long way. It's Sheilaism. Just my own little voice. These were the words of Sheila Larson during an interview in the 1980s that was done by a man uh, by the name of Robert Bella. Robert Bella was writing a book on individualism in modern America. And when asking Sheila about her religion, she's like, it's me. It's Sheilaism. I follow my own path is essentially what she is saying. In response to her quote, Bella wrote, this suggests the logical possibility of over 220 million American religions, one for each of us. Now, as crazy as that might sound, he's not wrong. What Sheilaism proves is that when you divorce religion from doctrine, and understand what I mean by doctrine, doctrine is the revelation from God about God. Okay, that's doctrine. Inside the Christian faith, doctrine is the revelation of God about God, right? It's coming from Him and it's about Him. So when you divorce religion from revelation or from doctrine, then you can create and you will create whatever God you desire. And you will serve that God in whatever way that you want. And listen, this sounds appealing to many people. The notion that we can worship whatever God and whatever means that we want, whatever way that we want, means that that God will never ask me to do anything that I don't like. That's kind of appealing, isn't it? <laughs> no one wants to be asked to do things that they don't like. No one wants someone to make demands of them to change. We want all that stuff to come from inside. We want it to be my idea. We want to do what we want. That kind of freedom sounds like true living does it? Freedom to do what we want, when we want, and no one to tell us no. But the reality is this. We will only discover true living when we worship the one true God alone. 
We will only discover true living when we worship the one true God alone. This, I believe, is the point of the first commandment, the first word that God speaks to Israel. There's a book called Christ-Centered Preaching. I had to read this book back in seminary, written by a man named Brian Chapel. Brian suggests that every passage of Scripture that we come to has a focus. He calls it the fallen condition focus. What that means is the Scripture is constantly um, exposing what is broken in us and then pointing us to grace in order to find the healing that we need. And, and so uh, the way Scripture often does this is that God reveals himself to us, and then he reveals ourselves, he reveals us to us. It's a really helpful way to read and to study the Bible, because it forces you to focus on the true meaning of what was written, and not just what you feel about what was written. And it directs your attention to God himself as the author and the one from whom we receive grace for our current condition. Now if we take this method, and you want to apply this method, I would suggest there are three questions that you can and should ask of every passage of Scripture. The first question is this. What is God saying about himself? What, what kind of God says what this God is saying? Question number two. What is he saying about me? Or we might say it this way. What, what kind of person needs to hear what this God just said? Number three. What do I need to do about it? Right? Now, I think these three categories, these three questions are going to be particularly helpful for us as we consider the Ten Commandments. With each one of these commands, what we want to do is ask, what kind of God says this? Well, what's this saying about him? And, and what kind of people need to hear this? What's this saying about us? And then, so what are we supposed to do about it? Right? So let's ask the first question of the first commandment. What is God saying about himself when he says, you shall have no other gods before me. And the most basic truth that God is saying about himself is that I'm the only one. There is only one God. In other words, monotheism is really at the heart of this commandment. Monotheism, meaning one God. He's not just saying that you should put him first among all the other gods out there, as if, you know, hey, you got a lot of options, but uh, everything's going to be okay as long as you keep me at the front of the line. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I am the only God. There are no others. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 is helpful for us here. Verse number 4, Paul writes and says, Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence. And that there is no God but one. Right? That's the thrust of this command. There are no other gods beside me, so stop trying to make them. Stop trying to find them. Stop serving them. But it's really an unusual command. This, is, this would have been a really unusual idea. It doesn't sound that unusual to us, mostly because we've grown up in Western culture and, and Christianity has dominated our culture for a long time. And, and we got lots of roots into Judaism and, and Islam is a big deal in our world now. And all three of the world's largest religions are monotheistic, right? There's, there's one God to whom we turn uh, who we give our allegiance to. So it doesn't sound that unusual to us, but in ancient Israel, understand they would have been the only ones with one God who believed that there was only one God. One commentator put it this way. 
This command was without precedent. None of the other nations in the ancient world prohibited the worship of other gods. They simply assumed that every nation would serve its own deity. I read just this last week in Ezra chapter 7, verse 23. Remember, Ezra is, is leading a group of Israelites back to Jerusalem. They've been carted off as captives. They're going back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And there's some opposition. Some of the other nations write letters to Artaxerxes and say, hey, you, you don't want this. Like, like they're going to come back and they're going to rebel because that's what kind of people these are. And Artaxerxes writes back and says, whatever is decreed by the God of heaven, let it be done in full for the house of the God of heaven, lest his wrath be against the realm of the king and his sons. In other words, there was this idea that, that we have our gods here in Babylon. Israel has their God over there in their land, but we don't want that God to get angry at us because we remember, like, we heard the stories of what he did to Egypt. Even though that's been thousands of years in the past, we don't want that God angry at us. So do whatever that God wants, right? So he doesn't come west with me or my sons, right? Every area had their own pantheon of God. So why then would God step in and say, you can't serve any gods besides me. I'm it. There's a couple of reasons that I want to highlight. Number one, it is because God is Yahweh. You remember what that, you remember that, that's the name that he gave to Moses on, on the mountaintop and the, the burning bush? You remember what we said that word means? I am that I am. He is. Well, what does that mean? It means that he is the all sufficient one. The one who needs nothing. He does not need you. He does not need what you can provide. He is not lonely. He is all sufficient. Which then means he can, out of his all sufficiency, supply anything that his people need. And here's why that's really important. In the land of Canaan, in all the surrounding lands, polytheism was the method of the day. Or maybe henotheism, which simply means we have a lot of gods, but we have one god above all the other gods. Henotheism. The reason they practiced polytheism is because it was a way to cover all of your bases. There was not one God who was all sufficient to meet all of the needs of all of the people. So what do you need in ancient times? You need good crops, right? Because that means survival and security. So what do you need out of a God? You need a God who can control the weather. You need a God of fertility that can produce plants and cause them to grow. We need children or else we're just going to cease to exist. They also provide security as we age. So we need a God of fertility that can make sure we can reproduce. We need protection from our enemies. So we need a God of war. We, we need a different God for all of these various areas of our lives because not one of them was all sufficient. So here's something that I think is worth considering. Assuming those gods were real. Let's just assume for a second they're real. It would be the height of cruelty for any one of them to demand to be recognized and worshipped as the only God. Because that God would be forcing his followers to choose what they would have to do without. Which is going to leave them vulnerable to famine or to childlessness or to attack from the outside. Because this God over here can't do all of those things. It is cruel then for an insufficient God to demand to be the only God. It leaves us vulnerable. It leaves us lacking things that we need for our own survival and well-being. The only kind of God, folks, who can make this demand on people 
is the God who has revealed himself to be the all-sufficient one. The kind of God who can provide everything his followers need at any time they need it. And he also has to love his followers. Because it would also be cruel for a God to have everything you need, but then refuse to give it because he just doesn't care, right? So why would God command it? He commands it because he is all-sufficient, and he commands it because he is love. He is the all-sufficient God who loves his people. He knows that there is no other God. There is no one or no thing that can provide for our needs like he can. And so if we go back to 1 Corinthians 8 for just a moment, Paul again writes, Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there be many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many quote-unquote gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. Did you pick up on what he's saying? It's like we exist because of this God, but we also exist for this God. If we exist by this God and for this God, then that means we can only discover purpose and meaning, and true humanity in this God. Serving this God then becomes the only way we can truly live. It's to serve Him and Him alone. Understand this, folks. God does not give us command because He needs something from you. He gives you commands because He wants something from you. For you. Do you understand the difference? I mean, again, we, we remember the pattern that we've been pointing out all along here is that God does not come to Israel in Egypt and say, listen, I feel really bad for you in slavery. Here's my Ten Commandments. Get your lives figured out. Start following these things really well, and then I'll come back and save you. That's not what he does. These people are already rescued. And he gives his Ten Commandments. Why? Because the commands are not for God. They are for you. They are for your living. As we said last week, the, the commands of God, the law of God, they're like a wide space. They're like the fence that keeps us safe in a broad space. Room to run around in full freedom and without fear. Crashing into the walls, just having a grand time without fear of falling over the edge or running into danger. Why? Because the laws are given by God for your benefit. He is all sufficient. He doesn't need anything from you. He gives law for your good, not his good. But the way idolatry worked in Canaanite culture, you worship gods who could do something for you, but in order to get them to do that thing, you needed to do something for them. Most of the time, you know what that was? The, the gods were, were, were kind of powerful gods. Like they controlled weather and, and you know, god of war. They, they, they believed their gods would be powerful, but there was one thing that the gods could not do. You know what that was? This is going to sound really silly. They couldn't feed themselves. So if you really wanted to honor the God and help them out, you would bring them an offering of food and of wine, of, of, of drink. And you would feed the God, and in return, the God would be so thankful for providing for them that they would in turn give you what you're looking for. And even in that, the true nature of the gods reveals itself, doesn't it? Because when they made the offering of food and drink, Guess who ended up eating and drinking? I mean, it ended up being a feast for the people. As a matter of fact, historians believe that Canaanites did not regularly eat meat. You know when they did eat meat? When they offered it to idols. That would become their feast. It would become an indulgence. You want to get hammered? Go offer strong drink to an idol. 
that way, you get to have your cake and eat it too, right? Like, I, I, I get a blessing from the God and get hammered at the same time, right? It's a materialistic system. Not only that, since their crops were dependent on rain and rain, okay, get this, all right? Uh, those of you with sensitive ears, just, just hang on for just a second, okay? Uh, the, the way that rain happened on the earth, it, it, was a, it was a result of intercourse between Baal and Asherah, okay, the, the female deity. And so if you wanted good crops, you needed them to have that relationship. So, so what do you do to make sure it happens? Well, you engage in that same kind of relationship in front of the gods. So when you read in the Old Testament about temple prostitutes, now you know why. We have to encourage Baal and Asherah in order to guarantee. So what? the whole system, the whole system is based on human desire in a way to manipulate, to get what we want. These gods were merely human constructs meant to satisfy the cravings of people. But folks, this is not how the all-sufficient loving God operates. He doesn't need anything from you. He doesn't need your food. He doesn't even need your encouragement. He doesn't even need your worship or your friendship. He is all-sufficient. Worshiping him alone is for your benefit, not his. It is for your good, not his. It means that love is really at the heart of this commandment, isn't it? The love of God for his people. He says, man, I'm the only one. Nothing else can satisfy me. Come to Worship me. And folks, this is the way we need to hear statements of Jesus in the New Testament when he says things like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That, that is an offensive statement in our culture. Our culture says you can have Jesus, just don't push him on me, just don't tell me he's the only way. You can serve Jesus, you can go to church, you can do whatever you want. Just don't tell me that that is ultimate truth. Folks, we didn't make that up. These are words from Jesus himself. How are we supposed to hear that? When he makes statements up like this about his exclusive role as God and Savior, please understand he is not making the statement out of weakness or insecurity. His jealousy over us is not a matter of weakness or insecurity. Like ours is often for other people. We get jealous because we're insecure oftentimes. But that is not God. That is not Jesus. It's not a matter of weakness or insecurity. It is a matter of a very strong love for you. It's more like a husband who is jealous over his wife. A good husband is not willing to share his wife with another man. It's a good way to end up dead. And we don't call the husband that says, you are mine, you will not go to another. We don't call him weak or insecure. We call him good. Why? Because that is love. So God who is rightfully our God by creation and by redemption. That's what he reminds us of in, in verses 1 and 2, right? I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I am your God. I rescued you. I redeemed you. I created you. That God is justified in his jealousy over us. Because his jealousy does not come from a position of weakness. It comes from a position of love. That wants the best for his people. So when Jesus says, I am the only way, it's not a statement of insecurity. It's a statement of divine love. It's Romans 5, 8, but God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not asking us to get ourselves right. Not asking us to follow our, his commands in order to be saved. But what he does tell us 
is that this, these words, these commands are for your good. They are meant for your flourishing. They are meant to promote your joy. That's what he's saying about himself. I am the only one. And it is for your good that you worship me alone. What is he saying about us then? Here's what I think he's saying. He's saying that we are the kind of people who are prone to make and to serve other gods. I mean, that's the reality, right? If we were not prone to make and serve other gods, then there is no need for this commandment. We are the kind of people who make and serve other gods. And by the way, understand who he's writing to here. He is writing to a nation that he has already rescued. He has already said of this nation, you are mine. He's talking to his people. Which means it sort of perk our ears up a little bit because we as his people then need to hear this as Israel would have heard it. We can look at Israel and point the fingers and go, man, idolatry was a problem, wasn't it? I mean, it's all over the Old Testament, all through Israel's history. As a matter of fact, just as they're entering into the land of Canaan, you remember the end of Joshua, chapter 24, verse 14, this new generation that arises, and they're, they're conquering the land, and, and Joshua calls them together, and he says, put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. I mean, they, didn't even, they, they got out of Egypt, and they're, they're like bringing gods with them still. It's a problem, apparently, all through the desert. It's a problem as they enter the land, so that Joshua is still like, put them away. There's only one God. And of course, we know the rest of the history of the Old Testament. They don't put them away. There are times when they do better than others. But ultimately, the the... the The conclusion of the Old Testament is Israel gets carted off into captivity. And the reason God gives is idolatry. They worship other gods besides me. That is the kind of people that we tend to be. So it's not hard to understand why then if the Lord shows his love to us in giving us the commandment, then it's also a matter of love for us to obey the command, isn't it? So so you you remember the Shema of Israel, this oft-repeated phrase by Jewish people in Deuteronomy chapter 6? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, right? Only one, monotheism. Therefore what? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Worshiping this God alone is not only a matter of his love for us and wanting what is best for us, it is a matter of our love for him. We love him because he first loved us. Folks, the reality is Israel, they were not the only ones to struggle with idolatry. We shouldn't think that just because we're not offering sacrifices to a piece of wood that we are not often guilty of idolatry. One author wrote, it is rarely declared but often practiced. God is in charge of the area called religion. but Life itself is ruled by a pantheon of deities. Career, possessions, greed, Self-esteem, family, friends, entertainment, fashion. In other words, we as Christians, we as American citizens, we are okay with the idea of God. We are okay with the idea that there is a deity out there. We are comfortable with Sheilaism. You want to say there's a God? You want to go on Sunday and sing to that God and pray to that God? That's fine, but come Monday, there's a pantheon of other gods out there vying for your worship. 
competing for your allegiance. They're the gods of career, possessions, greed, esteem, family, friends, entertainment, and fashion. And probably a whole host of others. Douglas Stewart, in his commentary on Exodus, he describes nine attractions of idolatry. What is it about idolatry that is so attractive to us? Why, why would Israel be attracted by it? Why would we be attracted by it? I was going to run through them. If you jot these down real quick, think through them later. I think in thinking through these, it helps us to understand idolatry in our age. So what is the attraction of idolatry? Number one, he says it's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. The presence of an idol guaranteed the presence of the God. As long as you had that image somewhere, then that God was guaranteed to be nearby. They were tied to that image. It was selfish. It was an entirely materialistic system. You feed the God, the God gives to you. But God wants something from you, you want something from him. It was quid pro quo, right? I scratch your back, you scratch mine. We both get what we want. It's easy. It's the third thing. The only thing you had to do was offer sacrifice. That was it. Just frequently give some food and some drink. Frequently show up. And there's no other demands about your behavior. There are no ethical requirements coming from these gods. The gods just wanted your food. That's all. Outside of that, you go do whatever you want. It's easy. And it's convenient. I mean, the idol shrines were everywhere. You start reading in Kings and Chronicles and the history of Israel. It's like, man, they set up uh, Asherah poles and in places to worship on every hill, it says. What does it mean? That means you can worship whatever deity you want, whenever you want, practically anywhere you want. That's easy. The system of worship in Israel was not that easy. Remember what God said? Where are you going to worship God? Are well, you going to come to Jerusalem? There are going to be these feasts, and you've got to make a trip. You don't live in Jerusalem? You've got to plan a week-long excursion. To come here and worship. Isn't it just easier? This is set up worship places everywhere. It was convenient. Number five, it was normal. I mean, everybody did it this way. Everybody had a pantheon of God. Israel would have been the only ones without. It was logical. Again, the more gods you have, the better off you're going to be. You just cover all your bases. Isn't that logical? I, I need a god of uh, rain, so hey, Baal, right? Let's, let's have you. It was pleasing to the senses. In other words, there was artistry in making the idol. Images of gold. Fine craftsmanship. There's a passage in the Old Testament that indicates that Israel, were not only, like when they would come to worship their idols, they would kiss the idol. There's artistry. There's beauty. There's an attractiveness. It was pleasing to the senses. It, I mean, if you put it in the modern vernacular, it looked cool, right? Number eight, it was indulgent. I said earlier, usually the only time pagans would eat meat was at these sacrifices that they would make. It included heavy drinking. You want to indulge? You want to overindulge? Pantheism is the way to go. Polytheism is the way to go. Number nine, it was a rock. You have desire. This is a way to fulfill. We have, we have temple practices. Come fulfill your every desire. Folks, you see why I say understanding these attractions help us to see more clearly the idolatry that exists in our culture. That has even in some way made its way into our culture and into our churches. It is attractive. Hopefully this helps us understand uh, not only the culture at large, but it helps us to understand our own hearts. 
people don't worship other gods. People don't worship career and money because they're idiots. They worship it because it's attractive. It looks good. It sounds good. It's pleasing. It's promising. People don't bow down before substances and get addicted to substances. Because they're too simple to understand the science or the technicalities of what it's doing. No, you know what it is? It's attractive. It looks good. It sounds good. It makes promises. And we get sucked in. How do we know if we have an idol? How do we know if we're serving an idol? How do we know if we are in violation of this first command? Here's how I want us to close. I want us to close by considering a quote from the book Counterfeit Gods by Tim Keller. It's going to give us a description of what an idol is. It is going to give us three identifying markers. I want to talk through those three as a way to identify idols in our own heart. Here's what he has to say. What is an idol? It is anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything you seek to give you what only God can give. That's an idol. So let's consider these three categories. Number one, anything that is more important to you than God, anything that would rise above God. In other words, is there anything in your life that is untouchable? Anything that you would say, I cannot do without this. It would be something that if God were to ask for it, you might hesitate, but you might even just flat out refuse to give it. It's kind of like, the you remember the rich man that came to Jesus? Matthew chapter 19, he said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus responds by appealing to the Ten Commandments. He's like, hey, look, if you, want, if you want eternal life, keep the commandments. And the guy's like, yeah, cool. All right, check. Did that, but I'm still missing something. I'm still missing something. What am I missing? And so then Jesus quotes from the second half of the Ten Commandments. You remember the, the, those laws that have to do with our relationship with each other? And he says, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, honor your parents. And then he kind of gives the umbrella, love your neighbor as yourself. And the man's like, yeah, cool, okay, got it. But what else? And what's fascinating about the way that Jesus chose to answer him is that not only did Jesus leave off the first three commandments, right? No other gods before me, no carved images. And do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. He left those three off. But he also left off number 10, didn't he? Which is what? You shall not covet. Why? Because Jesus knew that covetousness is idolatry. And he knew that this man was in violation of not only the 10th commandment, but the first. He had a God. And he's going to put him on the spot. If I ask for your God, will you give it? And so Jesus says, go and sell everything that you have and give your proceeds to the poor. And the man simply walked away. I mean, he was sad. He walked away. Why? Because there was something he valued more than God himself. His possessions and the security that they provided him were more important to him than God was. What is it for you this morning? There's something that you value more than God. Something you would hesitate or even just refuse to give up should God ask you. Maybe it's a career. Maybe it's family. God takes someone that you love and we just Decide to hate God for it. Why? Because it was something we value, something we treasure, 
more than we treasure God himself. Maybe it's a certain possession. What is it that is more important to you than God? Number two, what absorbs your heart and your imagination more than God? In other words, what do you think about? Like when you have free time, when you have downtime, where does your mind go? What captures your imagination more than anything else? NCAA tournament time captures my imagination. I don't know why my brackets are all busted up. I'm terrible at it. But I love it. What captures your attention? Teens, let, let me ask you this real quick. What, what do you daydream about? Like when, when there's no school going on, maybe you got time away from homework. Is it a car? Is it a relationship that you wish you had? What captures your imagination more than God himself? We could ask the same question to the kids. Kids, kids. Those of you under that teenage barrier, what captures your attention more than God himself? A game that you love, videos that you like watching? Folks, do we ever think about God and his greatness? Adults, what captures your attention more than God? What, what infiltrates your imagination? What do you daydream about? Is it getting out of a dead-end job and making more money? Is it a desire, a desire to have a family or maybe a better family? Is it your housing situation? Maybe it's as simple as getting a nap this afternoon. This is like all I can think about. When I have a free moment, that's my dream. What captures your attention more than God in your quiet moment? Where does your thoughts go? Where does your mind drift? The answer to that question may be pointing a finger at an idol. Something you value more than you value God himself. Number three, what is it? Or is there anything that you seek to give you what only God can give? Man, this strikes right at the heart of God in his giving of this commandment. It's his love for you that commands you to have no other gods before him. Because there is none that can give you what he can give. He knows there's no one else that can save you. There's nothing else that can satisfy you apart from him. Not a new job, a relationship, or a better house, or more money, or a nicer car. Folks, this question exposes a particular idol that's grown almost undetected in many of our churches. That is the idol of faith. Many Christians have been duped into putting their faith in faith and not in the Lord. You see this clearly in the name it and claim it theology that is out there. If you believe enough, you can have it. Well, that's not faith in God, that's faith in faith. Or more subtly, in the teaching that says, if you pray with enough faith, you can move the hand of God. We must be careful. Because in either scenario, my faith is the thing that possesses sovereignty, not God. So I put my faith in my faith. And not in my God. Some would say, well, aren't we saved by faith alone? No. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You understand the difference, right? Salvation is first about the grace of God to you before it is about your faith. Apart from grace, you would never possess the kind of faith in Christ that brings salvation. There must be grace. There must be God approaching and redeeming us. Regenerating our heart. Before there can be faith. But faith is also only effective if it is, if it is placed in the correct object. Right? 
You come to me and you say, hey, I, uh, Pastor, I am in desperate need of a heart transplant. If I don't get one, the doctor says I'm going to die. And I just want you to know that I have all the faith humanly possible in you. I want you to perform my heart replacement surgery. I have faith that you can do it. I got news for you. You're going to die. Your faith means nothing. Why? Because you put it in the wrong person. You, you understand what I'm saying? Your faith is worthless. This is what James says. What good is that faith? It's nothing. Your faith is worthless unless it has been placed in the correct object. Folks, beware of the modern Christian idol of faith. God is God. And not your faith. So what do we do? Two minutes to wrap this up. Give you two things. Number one, confess your idols. Be willing to give them up if God asks. Maybe be willing, maybe he's not asking you to give them up entirely. Maybe he's asking you to set them aside. Maybe it would be a healthy practice for you to take that desire and just set it aside for a while. Put aside social media for a while. Put aside sports for a while. Stop going to the gym for a while. Put aside the beauty routine for a while because maybe it would be good for you to put some space between you and the thing that tends to capture your imagination. Maybe you can't do either. Right? Because maybe, maybe some of the idols are things that we cannot just completely give up. Like, I don't know, kids. Right? We can't just give them away and the government frowns on neglect, okay? So we can't even walk away from them for a time. So maybe in confessing your idols, maybe it's time to take control of that idol. Maybe it's time to stand up to the idol that has captured your imagination and consumes your thoughts, that receives your resources. Maybe you need to ask the Spirit to help you bring every thought under submission to Christ alone. Number one, confess your idol. Number two, worship Christ alone. If we do not get this point, then we do not rightly obey the first commandment. We are to have no other gods before the true God of creation and redemption, and that command is transformed in the New Testament. When God says, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Folks, the God who at Sinai said, worship me only, says at the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my beloved son, listen to him. So Jesus can say, I and the Father are one. If you have seen the Father, you have, or if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. What audacity. What audacity. But folks, it means that if anyone refuses to worship Jesus, even if they claim to follow and worship the God of the Ten Commandments, they are guilty of blasphemy, and they are worshiping a God of their own imagination. Worship Christ alone. What do you worship? Where does your mind go? What do you trust? Where do you turn when things get tough? Christ alone can be all that you need. There's only one God. Serve Him. Serve Him. Pray. Father, Remember the words of John Calvin who said that our hearts are idol factories. We are constantly producing things to worship. To 
cravings of our heart manifest themselves in false gods. But God, they are no gods at all. At the heart of idolatry is us. We desire to be God. And so we fashion other gods in a veiled attempt at, I don't know, humility maybe? But yet it is the same sin that doomed the human race from the time of Adam and Eve. We desire to be God rather than to worship the one true God. So God, there are perhaps three requests that come from this passage. Number one, expose the idolatry of our hearts. Help us to see the idols that we follow. And give us grace to confess them. And to forsake them. Give us strength to control them, rather to be controlled by them. Or secondly, we ask that there are perhaps those who are with us this morning who don't know Christ. Who have never bowed to worship at the foot of the cross. Perhaps their faith has been in their own faith more than it has been in the risen Savior. God, may the truth of your word and the work of your spirit expose the idolatry of their hearts. May you become for them the all-sufficient, loving God who is their Savior. And Lord, in all these things, we ask for your help. Often we feel powerless, fighting against the attraction of idolatry. Lord, be gracious to us. Give us strength. We pray these things in Jesus' name.